Welcome to Shop Talk. My name's Calypso Rose and I'm director of the Institute. And we curate talks and workshops all across London. And we've curated um, all the talks for the last three days. At the moment, a mention from a top-notch blogger will do more for your business than the more traditional routes. However, they do have the reputation to be rather mercurial creatures, difficult to contact and tie down. Here at Shop Talk, we have assembled a panel of award-winning bloggers to discuss blogging and answer questions. Chair for this talk is Kate Baxter, Director of Communications Agency Octobercoms and writer of design blog Fa Fabric of My Life. And joining her are Kate Watson Smythe, uh, journalist and um, beautiful blog Mad About the House, and Katie Orme, full time blogger of Apartment Apothecary. And we've got one more Kate joining us. Um, oh, sorry, one more Tiffany. Um, joining us, um, who will be running from the back any minute. So uh, anyway, thank you very much, and um, please tweet their words of wisdom, hashtag shop talk. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Is this okay? Is this working? Cheers. Great. Okay, um, so this talk is being chaired by myself, obviously. I'm from Weblog Design, which is a, a new um, uh, design network uh, uh, designed to inform, inspire, and connect design bloggers. And so I'm really lucky to have a fantastic panel here with me today. Obviously, Tiff will be joining us very, very soon. She's just been held up uh, travel delays, as is always the case. But obviously had a really beautiful introduction from you guys already. But it's Kate watson Smile here, a former journalist. And, well, current journalist, but used to work for uh, The Independent and is a freelancer now as well. Yeah. And author of um, Shades of Grey, which is a, a beautiful book which came out in February. Um, and then Katie Orme, uh, who writes Apartment Apothecary. Um, so I should just ask these guys to quickly just give you a little bit of background about their blogs and, and talk to you about what they actually blog about. So it sort of uh, introduce themselves. Go back. <laughs> I'll go first then. <laughs> <laughs> so I set up Mad About the House nearly four years ago. Um, it focuses very much on beautiful interiors and uh, house tours, but houses that are for sale, so you can go poking around and having a look and see what's on the market. And a feature where I try and pick up small businesses called Objects of Design, which I do about three or four times a week, which is just something beautiful and useful, to quote William Morris, um, that I think you could have in your house. And I try and mix it up with lots of advice to how to make your own house into a home, how to personalize it, and lots of decorating tips from experts as, and not just myself. And I set up my blog about three years ago. Um, I actually was a secondary school teacher and for various reasons decided to set up a blog mainly my passion for interiors. Um, and within a year, I was kind of getting so many offers that I had to turn down because obviously I was working full time um, that I kind of saw a chance to make a big career change. Um, so yeah, I've been blogging full time uh, for the last couple of years. And I am obsessed with doing room makeovers. My flat um, never ever stays the same, so I kind of record that process. Um, DIY projects, um, home craft projects, and general kind of interiors, inspiration and, and styling. Perfect. And as you've seen, obviously Tiff has just joined us. Hi. <laughs> um, Sorry, so I'll, mate. <laughs> I'll give you a quick little introduction, and then maybe Tiffany, if you can tell us just a little bit more about your blog. Uh, but Tiffany is uh, an interior stylist. Uh, her blog celebrates simple design, independent makers, slow living, and accessible interior style. Um, so if you can just give us just a quick little sort of background on it. Sure. Um, well, um, how do I start? I'm an interior stylist, so um, the main reason for starting the blog was to um, document my work as a stylist and um, share my inspirations, um, new designers that I find. Um, so that's really how I started, uh, which was two and a half years ago now. So I'm mostly focused on Scandinavian designers, um, minimalist design, um, new independent designers, and focus on slow living as well. Perfect, thank you. Um, okay, so obviously got a really fantastic panel assembled today. You've obviously heard, heard how um, influential both all of these designers are. Now, blogs generally are considered to be today's version of word of mouth marketing. 
Um, and there's a study that I'd like to cite, actually, which has been um, posted on Forbes.com that says that 84% of consumers make a purchase after reading about a product or a service on a blog. Um, so people aren't just seeking information from their friends and family anymore. They really are looking at, at online resources. Um, and obviously, this is why more and more brands are really looking to work with bloggers. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about how brands can actually think about contacting and um, building uh, successful and creative working relationships with bloggers. And I think that's the most important thing to emphasize. What we're looking at is building relationships um, with the bloggers so that you can actually start to create um, meaningful and insightful uh, content uh, that will be enriching for not just the blogger and the brand, but also for the audience that you're trying to reach as well. So I would say we, I'm obviously a blogger myself as well, I would say on an average day we get well, at least 50 different emails from brands approaching you, trying to, trying to work with you. And there's uh, a whole host of really great approaches, um, and then a lot, lot more which are generally quite poor approaches. Um, so what I'm going to ask each of these ladies here is the kind of approaches that they see on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, um, so that you can kind of get a sense of what we all um, find when we open our inboxes every day. Um, so Katie, I don't know if you want to yeah. start. Um, yeah, so I probably have to spend at least two hours every morning kind of going through emails, um, if not more. Um, some days I can actually spend a whole day trying to kind of negotiate my inbox. So the, to be blunt, the emails that go straight to trash um, are the completely generic emails that I know have been sent out to a million different people. Um, because more often than not, it's just for information. I'll have a quick scan and then I kind of won't go beyond that. Um, the emails that really kind of grab my attention are the ones that I know have been written specifically to me um, and not kind of just, okay, there's your blog name and it's in that space that it's supposed <laughs> to be in, um, but they kind of understand what my blog's about um, and they perhaps have suggested a project or a collaboration that is kind of bespoke to my content and my audience. Um, so those, those will be the kind of emails that I will definitely kind of give my full attention to. Perfect. And Kate, we were talking earlier about approaches from uh, brands via Twitter as well. They, they seem to be quite a lot that come on Twitter which might have, for example, my name on them. And so I then think, oh, that might be interesting. Go and look at the profile. And then you see in their Twitter feed 25 of exactly the same tweets going out. And then you just think, well, I'm not sure you really wanted to talk to me. You just wanted to talk to someone. If you need to approach a lot of people or you do have a, a lot of targets, then at least break it up in your Twitter feed. Maybe send three and then have a break and then three more. Because otherwise, I just think, oh, well, I don't need to reply to that because they've sent the same tweet to 25 people, so I'll move on. So that would be one tip if you take that approach. Perfect. And, and Tiffany, you've got quite a sort of distinctive style. Do yeah, um, I think um, most bloggers, um, the, the first most important thing to do when you start blogging is to find your niche and find your style and, and be really consistent with that, um, which I certainly am with mine. And um, I do get quite a lot of generic emails from companies and brands that want to work with me who haven't really taken the time to look at my blog or my style or what I like to write about. So generally they go straight in the trash because they haven't taken the time to really identify who who I am, what my style is, and if we would be a right fit to work together. Because if they're not a right fit for me or my readers, they won't work. And my readers will be thinking, hold on, you, you do a lot of um, Scandinavian, very muted colors. You know, why are you suddenly doing bright polka dots? And I don't know, you, you get the idea. Perfect. Um, I think what's quite interesting to, to look at from these guys have been saying, and Kate will actually be able to back me up a little bit here, is the approach that you would take in um, contacting a blogger first off versus contacting traditional press. Uh, now, obviously, the, the media landscape has changed dramatically, and what we need to think about is the approach needs to change as well. Now, Kate's obviously got a, a long history working in Oh, I worked at The Independent media. for 15 <laughs> years. I've worked at The Daily Mail, Financial Times, most of them. Um, and back in 
I suppose the old days, you would get a stream of press releases. There didn't have to be a name on them. It was just the information. And there is an art to writing a good press release, which is probably for a different seminar. <laughs> um, but newspapers and magazines were not personal places. You could send out your information. They might pick it up. They might not. They might take some of it. They might take none of it. The thing about blogs, I think, are they are more like perhaps your, your knowledgeable friend. You do have more of a relationship with them. There are a lot of us out there. You can pick and choose which ones you want to read, how often you want to read them. You can dip in and out. And it's not unheard of that if you leave a comment on our blog that we will reply to you. So it's very different from newspapers where you might write to a magazine and three months later your, your letter is printed. So that's why you, you need to be more targeted and focused about who you're going to approach. So if I get an email which mentions a post I've already written, then I know that person has taken the time to research and is interested and might think that we're, we're a good fit. So it's, it's very much about the personal approach and not like the, the sort of blanket approach that newspapers and old, old media would have taken. Perfect. Okay, so I just want to quickly summarize uh, a little bit on some of the things we've spoken about. Um, so I think the most important pointers that everyone's backing up here is that researching the bloggers you're reaching out to in the first instance is a really sort of important thing to do. Uh, getting an idea of their specific interests, their needs, their goals, uh, their life circumstances even. Um, I'm a blogger who has a, a rented home and I'm very open about that on my um, feed and I quite often get sent um, requests for do I want home renovations, do I want to do a complete makeover in my home? Do I want to have people coming in and, and, and photographing it? And all of these things, if you had actually read my blog, um, at least a couple of posts, you would probably have understood probably wasn't going to be uh, an appropriate thing for me to do. Uh, so taking the time uh, to make sure that you tailor and personalize pitch. Um, and also, I think one of the most important things is to always address a blogger by their first name. 99% of bloggers have their names out there in the world, and you can very easily Can find I just out say the called. correct first name? The correct first Frank's name. a great name. It's not mine. <laughs> no. And also, I mean, I'm, I'm fabric of my life on, on all my feeds. Yes, but my name is not fabric. So a, an email that starts dear fabric is probably going to get deleted straight away. Um, so, okay, we've talked about how not to approach bloggers. Obviously, what we're really looking to do is to find out how we can creatively collaborate with bloggers and create some great content. Um, now, you guys have been working in collaboration with, with brands uh, for a number of years now, and obviously it takes a little while, uh, a little bit of time to sort of evolve those, um, those collaborations. But um, Katie, do you want to talk about um, how you've sort of approached working with brands in a, in a sort of creative and interesting way? How I've approached the brands? Yeah, uh, no, sorry, uh, how, how, um, how brands have approached you, I guess is probably a better way to do it, yeah. Um, I suppose it kind of depends uh, the size of the brand. Um, for smaller brands, um, one of the really nice things that I find is if they actually perhaps read one of your blog posts and leave a comment at the end of the blog post or perhaps comment on one of your Instagram pictures, just kind of showing that sort of level of interest and that kind of piques my interest and I go and have a look and um, rather than just kind of cold emailing, which sometimes perhaps doesn't work. Um, and it's really nice. Actually, I got one the other day. It was really nice, and it, it was a shop that I actually buy things from, but it's a very small shop. Um, and they just sent a very open email saying, you know, we really like your Instagram, and um, we'd just love to work with you. Do you have any ideas? So kind of throwing the kind of trust over to me of, you know, what do I think would work for that brand? Um, because I think when it's far too prescriptive, as in, we've got this one product and we want you to feature it this way and we want you to use this image and we want you to use this link. It kind of puts you off because that's going to be too um, too kind of narrow in, in terms of using my, my creativity yeah. and, and also tailoring it to my audience. Yeah, and chances are an approach like that has been yeah. sent out to another 10, 15, 20 other bloggers. So it yeah. doesn't have that kind of personalized feel to it. Yeah, so kind of keeping it open and saying, you know, can you suggest perhaps some, some collaboration or ideas? Perfect. And do you guys find you work, enjoy working that way? Having well, that kind so of one example I had where a company approached me and said, would I write about something? And I thought, oh, yes, that fits. I'm quite interested. And then discovered through a Facebook group that we belong to, because we do all talk to each other, 
that uh, the brand had asked me to write the post on such and such a day. And I said, well, I can't do it on that day. I do another regular feature. Can I do it the next day? And they said, oh, well, someone else is doing it the next day. And then you discover that it's been planned that each blog will do something every day, which from the company's point of view may look great. You're getting a, a week's worth of coverage. I felt like a mug. I uh, felt mm -hmm. like I, you know, we were all being spoon-fed the same information and we were all putting it out there on the days we were told to and the same thing. And I said I would never do that again, and I haven't. So my following on from Katie would be very much try and create some original content. So either give me an idea or let us try and have a conversation about an idea where we can do something that's original and also useful. So one example, there's a company called Rose and Gray approached me. I've known them for a long time. I talked to them on Twitter and they said, did I want to do something about their new summer collection? I thought, well, I could. That's just publicizing the new collection. Let's see if we can do something different. So I interviewed the owners and we did a post on uh, how to mix contemporary and vintage style. And it was really popular. We used pictures from the new collection. So they did get the new collection publicized, but I felt that my readers had something really valuable and different. And it, I did that post a couple of months ago and it's still sort of rolling around. So if you can have ideas like that, something that people won't necessarily see or read anywhere else, yeah. and then pick your target blogger. Definitely, I would, I would say, you know, from a, a blogger's perspective, giving a, a blogger a tool to create something that is entirely bespoke, unique to them, allowing them to take a unique perspective, create something that the rest of the bloggers that are their peers, they're not going to have the same content. I think that's the key thing. Because actually, I would say we've got fairly different blogs, but actually our audiences probably cross over. I was going to say so that. I think that the people are reading the same blogs, even if they're only dipping in and out. Exactly. And if they see that we've all written the same thing in the mm -hmm. same week, it puts the readers off, so you, you haven't gained anything by getting all that coverage. Exactly. And I, I think, going back to what Kate was saying about producing original content, yeah. um, there's a lot of us who prefer to take, um, say, if we're collaborating with a brand, to take some of their product and um, style it in our own homes as well, yeah. because it has to be something that we are happy to endorse in order to have it on our blogs. Um, so I will take a, um, a, a few days to plan out um, the post from thinking about how I'd use the product in my home, where I'd put it, how I'd style it. And then it's shooting it, editing it, writing it. So it really is um, its a very in-depth process, but you do get that original content and that original perspective from the blogger's point of view, exactly. which I think is really important to their readers as well, that yeah. sense of honesty. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Tiffany's blog very much the, the, the photography that's on it is generally being styled and, and taken by yourself. So from your perspective, you probably get a lot of people approaching you just wanting you to post their pictures, and obviously that definitely doesn't fit with your style. So an approach to Tiffany would be quite different than a, an approach to, to a different blogger who is happy to use stock photography. Can I just make mm. maybe a point about photographs yes. while we're on it? Yes. Um, again, big difference between newspapers and, and new media. In newspapers, we always wanted cut-out images. <laughs> Um, and when I first started blogging, I would put cutout images on and it would be like tumbleweed. Nobody wants to look at them. We need lifestyle shots. Either Tiff will style and photograph them herself. I don't always do that. I will use your shots if they're very beautiful or if you have them. If you haven't got them, then I might have to take them. But the photography is absolutely key to blogs. And if you're sending out a press release, if you can include one or two good, maybe low-res pictures so you're not clogging up the inbox, also not a WeTransfer link because we don't want to download hundreds of megabytes of everything to see if we like it or not, give us a taster of a good picture and then we can instantly decide and that's more likely to draw us in as well. Definitely. And Katie, your blog, you do quite a lot of sort of arts, crafts, design, home makeovers. So again, an approach from a brand yeah. to you would be... Yeah, so I find that my most popular um, posts are those where I'm kind of creating something new. Um, so, for example, I had a, um, a, a company con contact me about featuring their new summer furniture, and they wanted me just to feature their stock photography. Um, so I was like, to be honest, that's not going to be a popular post. It's going to get 
you know, some readers, but it's not going to uh, kind of create engagement, which is what you really want and interaction. Um, so suggesting something a bit different. So I suggested to them, well, why don't I kind of incorporate them into a sort of DIY, um, you know, a DIY on how to make a sort of summer canopy, and then your furniture is there. I'll style it with with what I've made, just so that it's a lot more interesting to the reader, there's something useful there for the reader, they can actually make that if they want to, if that's their thing, and obviously those are the types of readers that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, there's their product, looking nice, and therefore it's a lot more valuable to my readers, but yeah. also to the brand as well. And also for me, it's a lot more interesting as well, cool. because the most boring posts are those with the stock photography, because there's no creativity, there's no you're not going to get any interaction with that either. No, and obviously with stock photography, again, if another blogger's written about them, chances are they're going to have the same photography yeah. in another one. You might just have 50 blogs with all the same imagery, which yeah. I know is great can for I the brand, but not for us as bloggers. Can I just make a point about um, styled lifestyle images as well? Mm. If you are at any stage planning on doing any shoots for your own brand, um, is to think, if you can, a little about Pinterest while you're doing that, because there are some of us who may at some point need to use your stock photography on our blogs and it's very good in terms of Pinterest, Pinterest numbers, having repins, traffic back to our blogs which sends traffic back to you. Um, and I think the most popular images generally for Pinterest are portrait, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Portrait yeah. format. So when you're planning shoots, try and fit in as many portrait shots as you can. Yeah, good tip. And actually just to pick up on Katie's point, some, you might get a post written about directly about your product and that's great but there's nothing wrong with having your product in the side and yeah. sometimes you know you might send a product out to a blogger and it might just pop up again and again in photographs they're doing so yeah. you and you know if they remember if you're lucky or you remind them they will tag you or mention where it came from so you yeah. can get quite a few hits that way yeah. just even if it isn't the center of attention yeah, I think it's important to remember that building a lasting relationship with a blogger means that you will actually probably see content coming back again. You'll find that if you've worked uh, successfully with a blogger in the past, they will refer back to your brand. They'll continue to think of you for product features they might be doing or recommendations for, um, to any of their readers if they get asked any questions. And again, yes, just featuring products sort of religiously in, in Instagram posts and things, particularly if they're, they're products that they've then ended up incorporating into their home. I think, I think that's another really important reason why not to enforce a certain product on a mm -hmm. blogger, saying this is the product we want you to feature. Because actually, if you let the blogger choose what it is that is true to their style and true to you know, their aesthetic, mm -hmm. it will come up again and again and again because they really like it. Yeah, exactly. I think sometimes uh, we get leveled that we don't work with sort of small, upcoming, independent designers because a lot of the time people say that bloggers are all about the budget and about being sent big products or being paid to write things and that's not necessarily always the case. Uh, Tiffany in particular, you do some really great posts with independent designers. Uh, you've worked recently yeah, uh, with Nina and Co. Yeah, I think Nina it's really Co. important too, mm -hmm. actually, yeah. in terms of highlighting new younger designers mm -hmm. as well. I think um, I'm all for giving them support and a leg up. Yeah. I'm happy to do that. And you've done some really nice posts where you've sort of, with small products, done some creative styling and, and shared them on Instagram and you know regularly sort of promoting that brand which has driven additional traffic to them and I coincidentally I did a post today on a small company mm -hmm. who've made chairs and I've used their photography it was great photography and I've, I've used it all so hopefully from their point of view as well they might have a return on on the money they spent on the photographer because I have used it so it's a great picture and also other ways that you can kind of create content that doesn't necessarily involve gifting of product or, or, or payment or what have you. Um, Kate, we were talking earlier about some of the advice columns that you, that you have on your site. I, yes, I was approached by a lighting company. They, they're quite high-end and their products are quite expensive, but they, they wanted me to just use some of their stock photography. I do a feature every Monday called 10 Beautiful Rooms and they wanted to be in that. And the pictures weren't quite right. I think mainly because there was a lot of light in them and so they became very yellow and that didn't work. So we came up with the idea, we would do a series on how to get the lighting right room by room and their creative director came to my house and went round the bathroom, the kitchen, the bedroom and the sitting room with a view to saying what I'd got right, which was very little apparently, um, and, and what I, how I could put it right. And so I did four posts, one a month for four months um, and hopefully 
it had a lot of positive feedback. I think a lot of readers understood suddenly what they could do. You didn't just have to have a grid of spotlights in your kitchen. There were more interesting ways of doing it. And again, that post has had feedback. It's carried on. Then after I'd finished working with that company, a very small company came to me who restore and sell vintage lights. And they asked me if we could work together to do advice on how to buy vintage lights, whether you should buy it from the car boot sale, what you should do. So there's always spin-offs and different ways of looking at things to try and create that original content, which isn't just about shoving your product under someone's nose. Perfect. Um, and also, when you're thinking about uh, approaching the bloggers and social media influencers, uh, social media actually plays a huge part in the way in which we communicate with our audiences. So you might not necessarily need to even think about working with a blogger on creating a bespoke blog post. It might be that you're actually looking just to work with them on, on a smaller feature, uh, something that they can push out on social media perhaps. I know, um, Katie, you work with, um, or you, you've coined the, the term Styling the Seasons. Yeah. It's a, a collaborative that you do with a few other, other bloggers. You've yeah. worked with uh, Bloom and Wild on that. Can you tell me yeah. a little bit about that? So um, I run a hashtag called Styling <laughs> the Seasons. Um, I know that sounds a bit weird. Um, <laughs> But it's kind of a blogger project, as it were. So um, other bloggers get involved, and they blog each month about um, styling the seasons within their home. Um, and it's a really nice way of, of smaller brands as well to tap into these little creative projects that are going on um, with lots of different bloggers. Um, because not only do they encompass the, the one blogger themselves who's running the project, but lots of other bloggers are taking part. Um, so we were um, putting on an event to, as part of that project, and Bloom and Wild um, were a company that we approached to sponsor the event. Um, and they sent out flowers to 10 different bloggers who styled them in their home. And then we invited 20 different bloggers um, to a spring floral workshop and Bloom and Wild provided the flowers for that. So that was a really nice way for, for a brand to kind of engage, not just with one blogger, but a number of different bloggers um, and kind of interact with us in quite a sort of bespoke way. Um, so, yeah, so kind of, you know, trying to find these little projects that are going on, whether it be urban jungle bloggers or um, function and form, you know, there are lots of different projects that are going on that you can kind of try and get involved in. Perfect. Okay. Um, I think actually we're kind of getting to the point now where we should probably be opening up for, for questions. Uh, we can obviously keep talking if you'd like, but I'm sure you might actually have some key questions maybe uh, for any of the individual panelists that you might have. Yes? <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Um, money. money. Do we pay? <laughs> <laughs> Kate, do you want to take that one? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, I, it's a tricky question. Obviously, uh, we all understand that the smaller brands don't have lots of money. Um, what I think we would probably all do is when we work with bigger brands who can afford it, we would hope they would pay. And we, all three of us are interested in discovering smaller brands. And we understand you don't have the money. So we do get that. Um, we do have to eat. And I remember getting a very long um, and, and stressed email from a, from a young interior stylist a couple of years ago saying, I've got 47 cushions and three Kindles and 14 tin openers and I can't pay the rent this month. So it, it, there is a point at which there's only so much product, I guess, that a, a blogger can accept. Um, and I think if you are building up a relationship, perhaps if a blogger has discovered you um, and you've worked together, that you would hope that that was a success and maybe next time you could go back and say, perhaps this time we could pay or you build it up like that so that you, you I hate this word, make that journey together, but from you know, discovery and have a relationship. Yeah, well, I think we should also make clear is that every blogger has a very different approach to things. So some bloggers will want to get paid for absolutely everything that they do. Other bloggers kind of mix and match, and other bloggers very much are just every post that they do. They're not necessarily taking payment for it. It is very much about tailoring your approach and about finding the right blogger to work for you. Um, some of the, the bigger bloggers, the ones who obviously have got the biggest audiences, are going to be commanding bigger fees. That 
said, you know, yes, they've got a, a big connected audience, but some of the smaller bloggers, the bloggers who are just starting out, might also still have a really good engaged audience and be much more receptive to doing things. I would um, also say maybe don't, don't be scared if you think your product fits yeah. with one of the bigger bloggers and you're just assuming they're really expensive. Yes. It's always worth asking because Definitely. they may well just like your stuff, understand that it is a fit, and they will do it for you. So don't, you know, in the same way you shouldn't, blanket target everybody if they don't fit if you really think someone fits don't be afraid and maybe you have to get the the, the, the dirty money bit out of the way at the beginning and say <laughs> yeah, you know really i think we're really good fit we don't have any money but yeah. um don't go all the way down the line with a blogger who you're not sure about yeah. their approach and then after 15 emails say by the way that's the worst yeah 20 emails in and they're like by the way da, 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 da. i think just be really upfront in the first email even because yeah. then you're handing over to the blogger to decide whether it's right for them or not yeah um I, i'd say the only thing that ever kind of annoys me is if i'm like okay for that this is how much money i, I, I need if someone then comes back and says, no, 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 we're not going to pay you anything. You know, so I kind of, I, I, I think kind of just respect if they've said that that's how much they want and that and you can't do that, then just leave it. Like, you know, kind of coming back and saying, no, 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 we're not going to give you anything, but we want you to do this. That's the kind of annoying part. But yes, yeah, so I just think be really upfront and honest at the beginning and then they can make up their mind. And also you can sort of trade it. You know, we don't have any money, but we've got a good idea. Yeah. So don't yeah. just email us. I haven't got any money. haven't got any ideas. Yeah. Here's a cup. Just write about it okay. with 10 other people, you know, so... If what you lack in, in money, make up for maybe with an idea or a styling project or something like that. It, it could also be if you're, if you're a young designer and you've got a beautiful studio and you can actually say to the blogger, actually, I'd really like you to come to the studio. I can show you my design process. I can talk you through. I can give you some really beautiful content. You can spend the day screen printing or drawing or, or making with me. Um, and that will then give the blogger some really interesting, unique content, stuff that they can use behind the scenes for, for their Snapchat, for their Instagram, something like that that actually adds value to the, the blogger as well as adding value to yourself as a designer could actually be a really interesting, creative way to start that relationship. And then, as you say, further down the line, when you're both in a, in a much more successful position, then, you know, finances will be a bit more um, agreed then. Any other questions? Yes, we've got one just back here. I'm just thinking, like, in the reverse effect, like, with people, sorry, I hate these things, uh, people, like, approaching you and stuff, do you ever find products that you kind of like and you then go out and then approach those people? And how Every does that day. Work? Really? Like <laughs> yes, all the time. <laughs> and it's really hard to, um, uh, what's the word, make a decision on how you're going to approach that and... Um, how you can make it work within your own space at home. Um, yeah. I, spend, I spend a large part of every day looking for new and interesting stuff um, to put on there. I, I post five times a week, and I'm always looking for interesting stuff that fits. So I will just look for it, and I, you know, I might approach you. I might just write about it. Yeah. Um, and then tweet about it. Exactly. Bloggers are not passive. We're not sort of sitting here waiting for you to email us and, and asking us to feature your products. We are actually actively looking, trying to seek interesting news, trying to make sure we don't have the same content as one another and can discover the next big thing and be the first person to break that news. So that's what I would say. If you're a new designer and you've got a, a new product uh, that no one has ever seen before, um, we're actively looking to, to try and find that. Um, so, yes, whilst we're obviously looking to contact you, again, if you guys get in touch with something that's, that's new and that you've not shown to anyone else, then that's also... Uh, I think there's like an gold. element of <laughs> friendly competition yes. sometimes, <laughs> sometimes going on, isn't yeah, there? Because definitely. we do overlap in our circles. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's very easy to want to feature the same thing within the same week of each other, but you have to kind of find something else that might work instead. Exactly. And, and don't forget there are more and more of us now so there is there is the right blog for you and your product <laughs> yeah. if you look you will find the right match definitely oh, actually just quickly before you yeah. take over clips i just wanted to say um <laughs> so we've been running this talk as, as we blog design and actually you might actually have a few questions that you're, you're too scared to put your hand up for or what have you. We, um, every fortnight actually on Twitter we run a we blog design, hash, um, we blog design tweet chat 
Uh, so just search for the Weeblog Design hashtag to find it. Um, so at 8.30 tonight, we'll actually be sort of at asking a few additional questions to our full network of Weeblog Design bloggers. Um, so asking some of the questions that we've asked the panel up here tonight as well, um, just so that you can understand just how different each blogger's approaches are. Um, so it might be something that you want to kind of keep an eye out on Twitter uh, tonight from 8.30. Thank you so much. Really insightful panel talk. Thank you. Thank you.